What is up everybody? It's Chris from The Rewired Soul where we talk about the problem but focus on the solution and I'm joined by a very special guest, Dr. Mark Goulston. Can you do my audience a favor and just kind of introduce yourself, your background and all that good stuff? Yeah, I will begrudgingly because if you look behind my shoulder, I wrote a book called Just Listen and actually another uh, podcast host said, you know, Mark, you're a terrible listener. <laughs> but anyway, I, I can't go silent and just listen to you. So, so what's my background? I'm, I'm a psychiatrist, uh, been a psychiatrist for 40 years. And the first 25, I was a boots on the ground suicide specialist. What does that mean? It means that other psychiatrists, universities used to refer me their suicidal patients and, and nobody killed themselves. And I never figured out what I did. Mm -hmm. um, and but I figured it out recently. And so that's why I'm excited to be on a mission to prevent suicide, because, you know, if, I'm sure you've noticed, Chris, we have all this suicide awareness, we've got all these programs, mm -hmm. why is the suicide rate going up? And I have some idea about that, because what would happen is universities, professors, other psychiatrists would refer me their, their suicidal patients. Mm -hmm. And this is a little bit of my being passive aggressive towards the establishment, because I would go back to them and I'd say, do you want to know what I do? And they say, is it evidence based? No. Do you have a control group? Well, my control group is your program where people do kill themselves and my mm. program, they don't. And that was a little bit passive aggressive. It didn't win too many friends. Yeah. But they, they would say, no, if it's not evidence based, if it's not control group, we can't even listen to it. I said, why do you send me people? And they say, well, because you have this reputation that when people come to you, they don't kill themselves. Yeah. And, and I, the challenge was, uh, I didn't know what I was doing until recently. And I've dug into it because suicide's all around us and, mm -hmm. and it seems to be getting worse. Yeah, and that's, it's interesting that you brought up that point because today we're gonna to be talking about why these suicide rates are going up, but we have increased awareness. So here in Las Vegas, uh, I know they do this all over the country, but the American Foundation of Suicide Prevention, they have the Out of the Darkness Walk. And myself, my girlfriend, my son, we've participated in the last three years. The next one's in a couple of weeks here. But yeah, so I come from the addiction background, being in recovery myself, working in a treatment center. And one of the things is, is and I don't know if this is, calculated in the the statistics but off like oftentimes when i look at drug overdoses for me for example i was trying to kill myself with substances do they calculate that at all because many people with addictions are suicidal but they just use a different method i look i look I, i'm not a statistician and i think some studies calculated in uh and and of course what you'll hear the statistics and then people will say, and we think this is a much underreported because there's a lot of people who are dying by overdoses and we tend to call it accidental, but really what it was is probably uh, a, a completed suicide. So it's, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the problem is much bigger. Uh, one organization that I'm starting to get involved with is something called Mission 22 for veterans. Mission 22 mm. is focused on the 22 veterans who kill themselves every day. and Here's here's what gets to me. So if you think the 22 veterans kill themselves every day, you could probably multiply that by tenfold of the ones who make attempts. Right. Yeah. Live, and then multiply that another 10, maybe 50 fold of those veterans who wish they were dead, wish mm -hmm. the pain would go away and mm -hmm. they can't make it go away. So it's a huge problem. And, and I think what's happening is we have the awareness and we have the programs my whole approach to helping people is going to where they are in the dark night of the soul. Why do you think that helps? Because something I've written about, which has gotten a fair amount of coverage, is that I actually wrote an article after Anthony Bourdain uh, died by suicide. And I said, why people kill themselves, it's not depression. So it got, you know, it got 550,000 views and 70,000 reads in six days. Oh, wow. And what I said is there's hundreds of millions of people, maybe in the billions, who are depressed, who don't kill themselves. Mm -hmm. There's many, many people who have a, go through a divorce, lose a job, and they don't mm -hmm. kill themselves. It contributes to it. 
And I said, but one of the things that nearly all the people who are suicidal or die by suicide have at the end is they have despair. And if you break the word despair into D-E-S-P-A-I-R, it means feeling unpaired with reasons to live. Mm. Hopeless, without a future. Mm -hmm. Helpless, I can't help myself. Powerless, I don't have any power over this. Useless, worthless, meaningless, Mm. pointless. And so my view is that when you feel unpaired with all the reasons to live, you pair with death to take the pain away. What I discovered is when you pair with people in the dark night of the soul, underneath, way, way deep where they're hurting, they'll pair with you. So let me give you an anecdote that changed everything. It's actually in my book, Just Listen. So my book, Just Listen, is about how do you cause other people to feel felt? And feeling felt is different than feeling understood. Now, feeling understood is better than feeling misunderstood, but feeling mm-hmm. felt, it's different. So uh, so years ago, one of my earliest mentors was the leading pioneer in the study of suicide. It was a psychologist named Dr. Ed Schneidman. Mm-hmm. And if you look him up, you'll find his name all over the place. Uh, he founded the American Association of Suicidology. He co-founded the Suicide Prevention Centers in Washington, Los Angeles. And he was at UCLA as a professor when I was there in psychiatry. And what would happen is he mentored me and he would refer me. He would go up and do consultations to inpatients who were still suicidal, but they weren't acutely suicidal. So they had to be discharged because you can't keep them there forever. So he would go up to a consultation and refer them to me. And what I started to learn is when I would see them and I was checking boxes. So I'm looking right into the camera now. And so if instead of looking into the camera, like I'm looking into your eyes, I was checking boxes like this. So imagine you're looking out at me for hope. And mm. I'm saying, uh, how's your sleep? Yeah, yeah. Do you have pills at home? Yeah. What, 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 what's your support structure like? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, do you exercise? So what's happening is I'm checking boxes. You're looking at me saying, I'm running out of f- time. <laughs> yeah. You're checking boxes to cover your ass. And I'm not going to yell at you because I don't want to be thrown back in the fucking hospital. And yeah. you're checking f- boxes. And yeah. the point, they don't say that. So what I learned is to throw that away. But I learned it with one episode. What happened is I used to moonlight at a state hospital to pick up some extra money. So when you moonlight... You're there for 48 hours at a state hospital uh, doing the admissions and called to the wards to write up various orders. Uh-huh. But sometimes you're up for 36 hours. So there was one weekend when I was up for 36 hours. And on Monday, I was seeing a patient that I'll call Nancy. And Nancy had made three or four suicide attempts before I started seeing her. She'd been in the hospital three to four months, you know, every year for four or five years. And I didn't think I was helping Nancy. Mm-hmm. I thought I wasn't doing anything except, you know, she saw me and it was the longest she'd gone without a suicide attempt and she never made eye contact. So if I'm looking at her like this, she's like this. Mm-hmm. And so it's a Monday, I go in there and she's like that. And suddenly as I'm looking out at her, all the color in the room turns to black and white. I mean, I'm looking out and I'm going, oh my God, what is going on? And it was black and white. Yeah. And then I felt this chill all through my body and I thought I'm having a stroke or a seizure. So because she wouldn't look at me, it wasn't rude for me to do a neurologic exam on myself. So she's like this and I'm going like this. <laughs> yeah. Tap my knees, you know, and and then I figured out I said, I'm not having a stroke or seizure. I'm I'm all here. Now remember I was sleep deprived. And then I had this crazy, crazy idea that I was looking out at the world through her eyes and feeling what she was feeling. So because I was sleep deprived, I blurted this out, something that I probably normally wouldn't say, but you know, I was, my inhibitions were, and I said this, Nancy, I didn't know it was so bad and I can't help you kill yourself. But if you do, I will still think well of you. I'll miss you. And maybe I'll understand why you had to, to get out of the pain. And then when I said that, I thought, I just gave her permission. Yeah. I just blew it. And, and she was like this 
and it was like something got triggered. So she's like this. And then she looked at me. I mean, she looked right through me and I looked through her and I realized I got it right. And I got paranoid. I thought, oh, great, great. You know, she's going to say, thank you. I'm overdue. Yeah. And I said, Nancy, what are you thinking? And she said, if you can really understand why I might have to kill myself to get out of the pain, maybe I won't need to. And then she gave that up. And then what I said to her, I said, here's what we're going to do. I'm not going to give you advice or solutions that you're not going to follow. And then you're going to have to come back and tell me why you didn't do them. Right? Is that okay? And then she opened up. She, she was she was in. And I said, what I am going to do is I'm going to find you wherever you are. And I'm going to keep you company there as long as it takes. Because I don't want you to be alone there anymore. Uh -huh. I'm a medical doctor and my view of deep trauma, mental psychiatric trauma, is it's the same in my mind as physical trauma. Okay. So physical trauma, you have a deep wound and you have to go in there, clean out the wound and you put a drain in the wound and it naturally granulates in. It heals from the inside out. If you try to suture the wound too quickly, it becomes infected septic. Uh -huh. But my view is what I did, and I'm teaching people now, is how do you go into the dark night of the soul, right at that abscess in the middle of their psyche, soul, and spirit, mm -hmm. and you keep them company there, and you leave an empathic drain so that they're always pairing with you, and it granulates in with hope. So can you follow any of this or is this all No, problem? no, it's absolutely like something that I'm always thinking about, you know, when when I was working in the treatment center and working with a lot of people struggling with dual diagnosis, they had addiction and some other disorder. And I'm always been curious about like the root cause of these issues. Is there is there anything that you've seen just from your experience where this comes from, whether it's you know, biological, you know, their environment, how they were raised, like when does that disconnect happen so here here again nobody from a reputable university is going to listen to this i'll that's listen to it mark but your listeners might <laughs> see i think what happens is we're born into the world powerless vulnerable helpless and we're fed and we're clothed but we're but also the environment around us is poured into us so imagine you're there and you can't even see, and all you know is you're hungry, and you hear yelling. You hear someone saying, would you take the nipple already? And, and you're thinking, you don't even have language, and you're saying, well, stop poking it in my eye. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and then imagine you're just lying there, and you don't know what's going on, because when you're in the womb, you know, your wish was per command. And then, and then imagine this. You, you hear in the background a male voice, and you're thinking, Oh, oh, looks like I have two parents. Oh, that's my mom and my dad. And what she's saying to dad, uh, can you feed this thing in the middle of the night? Can you get up already? Yeah. You know, get off those games of yours and take care of your kid. And I'm thinking, holy shit. So what happens is if you're born into either anger or total neglect, would they just leave you with shit in your diaper? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What happens is there's a guy named Eric Erickson. He talks about the psychosocial stages of development. And the earliest one when we are born into the world is we're born either with trust or mistrust. Uh -huh. And if you're born with trust, you sort of go into the world and you're not tentative because you're born with trust. If you're born and raised with an unsafe environment, you develop distrust, you're tentative. So my view is that there's a lot of people who are born and they don't get that optimal empathic connection. So what I'm doing with these suicidal people is I'm giving them this optimal, I'm just in there with them. You know, I'm just, I'm, I have my finger in the dike of the abscess in their soul. And I'm keeping my finger there until it heals around it. And so what I believe happens is when you didn't get that, and most people haven't, because even with, even with the best uh, of intention parents now, parents are in a rush. Uh -huh. Sometimes when I would see when I would see female patients or mothers, I said, "What are you here for?" And they look like this. I can't find my warmth. I'll uh -huh. say, "What do you mean?" I'm irritable. I'm annoyed. 
you know, I'm yelling at my kids, you know, do your homework. I can't find my warmth. And women have told me, you know, even if we're high achievers, a woman without warmth is not a woman. Mm. And a lot of that is because a lot of these women do not feel supported. They feel that they're working, they're having, a, you know, they're taking care of their aging parents, they're mm -hmm. trying to take care of their kids, and, and there's nothing left to give. And so what happens is those kids, instead of internalizing safety, what, what do they internalize? At, at, at the very least, an overwhelmed parent. So my view is that we get past that. We never get over it. There's a vulnerability. There's a crack in the porcelain instead of us being solid. Uh -huh. And then we go through life. And guess what? Some people discover achievement. Wow, this is great. If I achieve something, I make my parents happy. I make everyone happy. And this is kind of neat. And that's kind of fun for about 30 years. But what you discover is it's not fulfilling or satisfying. Uh -huh. Something that you thought it would fix didn't because it doesn't make that hurt and fear go away. This is crazy, Mark, because it's like you're describing my life. So <laughs> you and I have been talking for about a week now, but yeah, just everything that you're saying. So I'm the son of an alcoholic mom. And, you know, I, I read the book uh, by Dr. Uh, ugh, I'm forgetting her name right now, but she, she wrote the book, Adult Children of Alcoholics. Great book. And like, you know, and it talks about some of those symptoms that I developed because I didn't have that trust, right? My mom was always drinking, didn't know if she was coming home, didn't know what state she was going to be in. My dad was working a lot, so I kind of raised myself. But yeah, this is one of the reasons why, you know, I love the title of that book, Just Listen. And, you know, even the other book I just finished, Talking Crazy, like, I never felt heard, right? Like when I was growing up, I never felt that connection with my family, with anybody, like, I was going through this by myself and it, it led to a lot of anxiety when I was younger. I had a lot of trust issues and everything like that. And kind of like what you're saying, like I had a lot of pressure on me just to graduate high school because I was the first one in generations to do so. And I was like, yay. And like there was, you know, oh, yay, yay, Chris, right? But it's not sustainable, right? If I'm constantly trying to achieve just to get the attention and make people proud and all those other things. And then well, like in my addiction, I kind of got a case of the the screw it's and it wasn't until i found a 12-step program where i finally felt heard where like somebody was willing to just sit there with me and just listen and have me pour all this stuff out and there was no judgment there there was you know i finally felt heard for the first time in i got sober when i was 27 so the first time in 27 years i finally felt like someone heard me and like felt what I was going through and it was life changing for me. Well, I'm going to do, uh, I always do a little bit of voodoo in these things. So I'm going to do a little <laughs> voodoo thing and I think you're game. Uh, always. I'm, I'm going to channel you right now. But what I'm going to channel is you as a five year old that is yelling to me, can you tell grown up Chris to just shut up and find me? Because he's running away from me. You know, he's not hurting me like I was, but he's running away from me into this blah, 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 blah. And I've been here and I've always been here. And I'm just waiting for him to turn around and see me because no one's seen me. And I'm getting angry at him because he knows what it's like to be abandoned uh -huh. and run away from. And I've been in here the whole time. And Mark, I need you to get him to turn around and just see me. Just see me. Don't throw a solution. Don't be angry at me. I need you to get him to do that. And that's going to lead me into, I'm going to tell you something that I call piano story. You ready? I'm ready. I want, you to, play, I want you to play along with this. It'll tell you more than you need to know. There's a little boy named Jimmy, and he's six years old, and he lives in this really dysfunctional family. Uh, there's anger, there's hurt, there's whatever. But Every day when he comes home from school, he goes down into the basement and in the basement is a grand piano. Nobody uses it. And he goes under the grand piano and nobody knows he's there. And he just touches the brass pedals. He goes there because he also, you know, uh, has siblings who aren't happy either and can be abusive or ridiculed. Mm -hmm. And then one day as he's there, and he's probably on his way to being a little bit autistic, you know, him and the piano like this, looking at him. And one day, a man comes down, who's not in his family, and is looking through the basement, and the man sees him under the piano. And Jimmy gets a little bit nervous because the man comes over to the piano. 
and Jimmy won't look at him, you know, because his recollection of people is they either let you down or they abuse you. So he's like this with the pedals. And the man leans under the piano, not intrusively, just the right way. And he doesn't say, what's going on? Uh, what are you doing down there? Uh, you want to come out? You want to go do some fun thing? The man looks at him and says, mind if I join you? I love and, it. and the man goes under the piano and they're kind of like, you know, their their legs are like, you know, 90 degrees. And Jimmy's just there and, you know, he's not pushing him away, but he has no idea who this man is. And this is like a nine-month pregnancy. So after three months, Jimmy says to the man, what are you doing here? You know, and Jimmy has the courage to make a little eye contact. And the man looks at him in just the same way and says, you look like you shouldn't be alone. And Jimmy goes, okay, knock yourself out. And, uh, <laughs> and then three months goes by and Jimmy is looking a little bit more like him. And he says, is this normal? And the man says, what do you mean? He says, you know, I go to school, I come home, I come down to the basement, I sit under this piano. Is this normal? And again, the man looks at him in just the right way and smiles and says, it's not typical. And so another three months goes by. And at the end of this nine months, Jimmy is just, he, he's just looking at the guy. He's just staring at this guy. He's just huh. staring at him. And then at the end of the nine months, he looks at the guy and he says, do I ever get better? He's looking with all the intensity of a, a lie detector test, looking for any hint of bullshit. Yeah. And, and the man looks at him and says, absolutely. And Jimmy says, well, how do you know that? And the man says, because I'm you and we got out. Now, I was Jimmy under the piano. Really? And the way I do therapy. You getting it? Yeah. So can you relate to any of this? Yeah. No, absolutely. And, and, that, and that's the little part of you. I mean, I wasn't just trying to do a gimmick. There is a part of you that there's a part of you wants to feel your vulnerability, but you still want to be in control. And so you're racing ahead into activity. Mm -hmm. But there is that there's a little Jimmy inside you. He's been there and he's just waiting for you to turn around. And this is this is something that is an ongoing process, you know, and uh, things have been leaps and bounds. Like right before this, we were talking about, which we're going to mention in a sec, the stay alive video that you sent me and like, you know, my, you know, my semicolon tattoo on my wrist. And, you know, it's this it's this recovery, right? Like this progression and there's still, you know, speed bumps and everything like that. But I don't know. I haven't felt personally that I've gotten back to the dark place that I was over six and a half years ago where I didn't want to wake up anymore. You know what I mean? But like, what what are your thoughts like, you know, just for someone like myself who's in recovery from this thing and continuing to move forward and acknowledge the other things that might be still inside of me? Well, I think what it is, is you don't want to go back there and mess around. So there's a part of you that says, you know, coping ain't bad. Yeah, it'd be nice to heal. It'd be nice to be solid from the inside out. But coping's a lot better than what I was doing six years ago. So I don't want necessarily want to mess around with it. Mm -hmm. And so what you have, you know, there, there's something called PTSD. I wrote a book called PTSD for Dummies. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to re change the diagnosis. But because I'm an outlier, you know, I can't get in anywhere. And I'm trying to change the diagnosis to what it really is, which is re-traumatization avoidance. Can you explain that? So you ask anyone who's been through a terrible trauma. And I've had a lot of veterans who just say, holy sh that's it. When you've been through a terrible trauma in the military, you've been raped, or whatever it is, you do whatever you can to survive, but you know you're leaving a piece of yourself there because you're doing whatever you can to survive. So you, you get past it. And the way you know you're dealing with re-traumatization avoidance is if you talk to someone and they tell you about you know, a rape or they tell you about something horrendous and you say to them, Good for you. How courageous that you got over that. And you look them in the eye, they're going to look back and they'll say, I never got over it. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? I got past it. I'm tentative. I don't put my, I don't put two feet into anything, especially relationships. Mm -hmm. I'm only checking things and I don't really relax. I, I know fun, but I don't know joy. I know exhaustion, but I don't know peace. And, and then if you ask them, 
well, could you go through that again? And if I said, uh, Chris, let's throw you back into the dark night of your soul six years ago. You think you, you go back there? And what they say is, I don't know how I made it out alive the first time. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I, I'm not, I, you, know, uh, you know, the first shoe <clears throat> drop, I'm not playing Russian roulette. I'm doing okay for a person who's not solid. I'm okay. Yeah. yeah. And so the feeling is if I go back, the second shoe will drop and I will never come back. So my whole approach is I've actually, and maybe you'll show this video that I sent you from, from Stay Alive. It's called The Seven Words. Mm. And I've come up with something that I call targeted interventional empathy. I think that's it. And the idea is, let's say you're coping with having that core that wasn't solid because you were all alone in there. And so, uh, and so what happens is it creates this, uh, there's a word and, you know, there's a word when you have a heart attack, it's called the myocardial infarct. It kills part of the heart tissue. So you're there with this emotional infarct because you didn't have that connection. And so what targeted uh, interventional uh, empathy is, is you go into the person and you, and you touch the wound and you keep your finger there with warmth. You don't abandon it. You believe that if you, you, you clean out the wound, but you keep your finger there, and the seven words, and I hope you'll put up the, uh, the uh, excerpt from the movie. Yep. Uh, so here's the seven words. And, and see if you can feel the difference. So let's say you're a person, uh, you know, you've been through all kinds of treatment. You know, you have depression, you have anxiety, you know, and, and you, know, uh, you, know, and the, you know the usual things. So if you're there with a professional who, you know, has to check boxes. So uh, how depressed are you? Okay. On a scale of one to ten... Yeah. Ever have thoughts of hurting yourself? Uh, and, and I don't mean to be sort of glib. You know, I mean, they're doing the best they can. Plus, they have a protocol that they can't read. Yeah. See, my f good fortune is I never reported to anything other than the hurt in people's eyes. Mm. Only thing I was responsive to. So imagine someone's asking you those things, and you're thinking uh, when they say, uh, uh, are you feeling depressed? So there's a part of you who's been through so many treatments say, no, I'm a f happy camper what the f do you think i'm here for <laughs> right yeah no i came in because i'm euphoric what is yeah. your f problem yeah. how do you spell euphoric i know how to spell depression <laughs> <laughs> yeah so, so the seven words so you're there but the, listen to the tone it's not checking boxes so if i were if i were to say to you uh chris and you're there feeling a sense of urgency like uh, you know another another clueless person who's checking boxes and I say, Chris, seven words. And what you're thinking is, what the f seven words? And then I say it this way, hurt, afraid, angry, ashamed, alone, lonely, tired, pick one. And if you watch the, you know, in, in the movie, I'm in, you know, I'm talking to Kevin Hines who jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge. Mm -hmm. and, and if you see the little excerpt, he looks at me with a smile and he says, you know what he says? All of them. Yeah. But he felt, felt. Yeah. And so the whole thing is it's going in there. And I'll throw a business term into this. But, but anybody who's in business or in sales has heard the term, the assumptive close. Mm -hmm. I don't know the term, but with the assumptive close, you go in there assuming something so you don't have to ask it. Mm -hmm. So if you go in there assuming that people are feeling at least one of those, you don't have to ask them, are you feeling it? And so it invites people, if you're doing this with a, a person in your life, and they say all of them, you say, pick one. Pick the one that's worst. Tell me when it was the worst in the last week. Take me back there. Mm -hmm. And here's the magical thing. When you can get someone to share an event with you so vividly that as they're sharing it, you see it through your eyes, mm -hmm. and they relive it. They relive the feelings. But the difference is they're reliving the feelings, but they're not alone this time. Yeah. Let so, me. Are you, are you tracking with this? I, I am. And it's bringing up questions. So, so I just finished your book, Talking Crazy. The premise of that book is to how to talk with irrational people. But the last couple chapters are really about some like serious, hardcore stuff. The stuff that we're talking about right now. And, and you're, you're, you're talking from the, the lens of a trained professional. Like a lot of my audience and most people out there, friends, family members who might be in that dark place or have those dark places within them, like 
should should somebody reach out and ask them to go to those places or talk about these feelings that they're feeling? Like, what is your recommendation on that? Or should that always be with a trained professional? Well, you can go on the internet. In fact, without plugging a documentary, you could you could go to the doc. We divided it into eight chapters. And that'll be linked down in the description, everybody. Well, so and you can go on the internet. You could you could check our documentary, mm -hmm. but you can share that with people and uh, and use it as a catalyst. So you can you can hear the seven words I'm saying, and you say, "Oh, I like that," but you might not be able to have that trained empathic tone that I have. Mm -hmm. And so you might you might think, "Okay, I'm going to say the seven words to this, this person I'm worried about." Uh, what were they? Uh, hurt, uh, afraid, angry. Well, the point is, it's it's not inviting. Yeah. But what you could do is you could you, your uh, your viewers can go to that particular uh, excerpt and say, "Look, I don't know how to say it the way that guy, Dr. Goldstein, said it." Yeah. If I could say it that way, what would you say? So you you follow me? You use it as a oh, pivot. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then and then that gets the conversation going. Right. So I'm going to show you a video which I created, and it's called "What Your Teenager Who Won't Talk to You Wants You to Know." Mm. I created this to create what I call wait a second to create a conversation catalyst. So if you're a teenager and you feel your parents aren't getting where you're coming from, or if you're a parent saying, you know, I'm just not getting through. You could play this video and uh, tell your parents, this is why I don't talk to you. Or your parent can say to you, uh, your teen, your parent can say to your teenager, is this why you don't talk to me? So it's only a minute, but I'm going to play it for you, okay? This is what your teenager who won't talk to you wants you to know. One of the reasons I'm quiet around you, one of the reasons I don't tell you what's going on, one of the reasons I don't tell you how I feel is I have little to no confidence that you can help me feel better. And that's because as soon as I start to open up about something and you ask me how I'm feeling, you cut me off and you interrupt and you give me solutions that won't work for me, they'll work for you. I can't do it your way, I have to do it my way and I don't know what my way is. And so what I really need is for you to try to find out and help me understand who I am and you can't do that by giving me advice and solutions that I just don't want. What I really need from you is to find out what's going on inside me. I want you to be interested in pulling out how I feel because I just feel alone with it. I feel alone with it and I can't make how bad it feels go away. So did you get that kind of? Yeah, no, absolutely. And yeah, I remember uh, towards the end of Just Listen too, you had that letter that the teenager oh, yeah. wrote. And like that was, you know, powerful. And like, it just felt like emptying out all of it. And so like, that was like what your teenager wants to say, right? But like, do you think that's a lot of people? Like even people in their 20s and 30s, just maybe even with their friends and things like that? I think it's the majority of people. Which is why people run to escape and why the escape distracts you, but then you have to come back to yourself. And here's 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 my gripe with the internet, even though I'm on this show because you get a lot of eyeballs. <laughs> uh, I think what's happened is the internet and social media has addicted us to adrenaline. Adrenaline and dopamine, adrenaline and dopamine, adrenaline and dopamine. And adrenaline is excitement, dopamine is pleasure. What happens, and you'll know this as a, a former addict, the only thing more powerful than an adrenaline rush is an adrenaline crash. And people will do anything they can to stop the crash. Uh, because when you're on a crash and you're running on adrenaline, uh, that probably causes you to be secondarily ADD. Mm -hmm. And so you need the high adrenaline to be high Adderall just so you can focus. So when you're in an adrenaline crash, you can't even think clearly because you're so used to running on adrenaline. And here's the deal. There's another uh, hormone called oxytocin. Oxytocin is the hormone about being, about bonding, feeling close, feeling intimate. But we've sold out on intimacy to get intensity. You know, excitement is great. It's interesting, you know, my book, Just Listen, is the topic on listening in the world, but I can't get arrested for it in the United States. Really? No, no literally. I, I spoke in, catch this, I spoke in Russia to the Russian Federation for six hours, 
and, and it was translated, you know, spontaneously into Russian. It was just me for six hours and they didn't even look at their phones. They were so engaged, but Americans don't want to listen. They want to be listened to. And so I think the challenge is, and I was on another interview, I say, you have to make closeness, which is satisfying, equal to immediate gratification. So there's a lot of people, you know, uh, you know, I'm pretty good at this. I can open someone, I can crack someone open and, and I don't make them cry, let them cry. And as they cry, the pus comes out. And afterwards they say, God, that was just, that was so weird. Is it okay? Yeah, I think it was weird, good. It's interesting. I was a guest, I won't mention the person's name, but I was a guest on someone else's podcast. And he is just so articulate. He's bright. Uh, I, I know him pretty well. And he helps people with their marketing. He thinks, fa he, he talks faster than I think. And in the middle of it, uh, I said to him, I got to tell you something because I know you're a good person. And the last thing you would ever want to make someone feel is less than or stupid. And I'm feeling both of them with you. Whoa. You better believe it. He went, what? Yeah. I said, I know the last, I, I know you come from a good place. And the last place you would want to do, last thing you want to do is to make someone feel less than or stupid. And I would be very hesitant to bare my neck to you. And I, and I'm telling you that because I know it would be safe if I did that. I know you wouldn't ridicule me, but that's because I know you. And you might want to think about that. And Chris, I got to tell you, it's almost like his head flopped back. And he said, I said, what happened? He said, I haven't felt what you just did to me since four years ago when I almost died. And that's when I decided I got to change my life. And I've been slipping back. And he said, I, he said I'm British. I'm getting emotional. Uh, I said, well, look, we don't have to post this. You know, if it's too, no, no, no. He, he, and it's, here, here's, here's what happened. He said, no, no, no. I, I want to post this. In fact, I need this. I need to cry. I can't cry. I get so much to cry over and I can't cry. I need this. And the guy's been avoiding me like the plague. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you get it. You get it. It's yeah. kind of like, and so the point is, and I think what happens is he'll make his way back in my life because he'll get busy. And then he'll realize what I really needed was that connection that felt so real, but it scared me. And why did it scare? Because what I did is I gave him a taste of safety in the connection. He started to get emotional feeling it. But then what happens is it's surrounded by a sea of a cesspool of non-safety. Kind of like if I got through to you, you could say, wow, Mark, you, you don't know it, Mark, but you've already done that five times in our interview. Yeah. But, but you're right. I'll get back after this, after this interview, I'll go back. I'll go back to my whirly burly thing. And here, here's, see, here, here's, this is going to be fun. I'm channeling you, you know, Mark, I don't think I can help you with this because you're what my listeners need, <laughs> but you're not what they want. Cause what they want is me, 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 because it keeps the excitement going and the adrenaline going. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, but I am here to say you have what my listeners and I need. Mm -hmm. but we all chase after what we want until it's empty. Yeah, that's absolutely true in so many cases. I actually, at the time of recording this, just this morning, I released a video on digital minimalism. I finished a book by Cal Newport on that and how I've deleted a bunch of social media apps off my phone because like you said, it's that, it's that rush. And as a youth, like this is my primary job, you know, it was constantly like refresh, 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 what's going on, da, 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 right? But I was noticing uh, uh, this disconnect from a lot of things and that lack of personal connection. And now just doing it the last three weeks and kind of slowing down and just really enjoying the time when I go out to dinner with my girlfriend, when I'm spending time with my son, you know, we went out to dinner. He just got a cell phone for his birthday on New Year's Eve. And we even have him put his phone down and we get to connect, you know what I mean? And I, I absolutely love that. And it's just something I didn't realize was so lacking in my life, like right now in 2019, where we're all just, doing that stuff. How, how old is your son? He just turned 10. You may get away with this, but, uh, and I wouldn't do this right out of the gate. So uh, I would do it while you're driving with him because kids hate face to face, you know, heart to heart conversations. You know, they, they you know, they feel like, you know, shooting themselves. <laughs> uh, but, 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 but when you're in an activity like driving, mm -hmm. feed this into the conversation. You can say, what, what's his name? What's his first name? Dylan. You say, Dylan, um, I have a weird question to ask you. What is something that you don't feel either I or your mom understand about you? See what he says. 
then say, what is something that you feel that nobody in the world understands about you? To have him say that. And then you say to him, um, what's that like? Listen to him. And then, the, and then say, at its worst, what's that like? And you may get lucky because, uh, uh, and then if he opens up about something, uh, you can say, uh, Dylan, um, I have a favor to ask you. Just because your mom and I get too busy with all our squirrel brain, mm -hmm. I can't allow you to feel so alone in something like that. And my favor is you do whatever it takes to get my attention. Yeah. You know, I might be distracted. I might not immediately give it to you. Mm -hmm. But I. But as your dad who loves you, mm -hmm. as your dad who has felt really alone in places, mm -hmm. I can't allow you to be there alone. Yeah. No, I'm... Man, I'm glad that came up because we we used to be super tight. Like I've been teaching him like meditation and things like that. And he's kind of, he's at that age where he's, you know, kind of separating. He's getting his new friends and everything like that. But I know a lot of my hurt and pain when I was around his age and through my teenage years was I never felt like I could talk to my parents or adults about that. So I'm going to try that. I might even make a video about me trying that and say it tell everybody how it went but i actually just spoke at a high school for two days like i went to two separate days and they asked me a bunch of questions about mental health and the stigma and how to get help and something i've noticed you know through my own recovery working in a treatment center we we dealt with you know uh, adults so but a lot of our clients were like 18 to 24 and one of the number one things i hear is that youth is afraid to tell their parents about when they're going through something like do you have any recommend like a side like is that the best recommendation like is that like just to let them know like tell me like talk to me like uh, yeah i would try it but mm -hmm. uh well, I'll share an anecdote. This is a very personal anecdote, but I'll share it anyway. I dropped out of medical school twice, and I think I had untreated depression. And I had, my father passed away in uh, 93, 94, but he was pretty critical, and he could be shaming. And I remember when I was going to drop out second time, dropping out because I thought if I continued, something bad would happen. I wasn't going to hurt anyone else. And I wasn't thinking the S word, but probably wasn't that far away from it. And I remember I said to him, I'm leaving medical school. And what he said is, what'd you do, flunk out? I said, no, no, I'm passing. I said, well, why are you dropping out? Well, I'm reading stuff and it's not going in. Yeah, but you're passing. Yeah, but I'm reading stuff and I'm not holding on to it. Yeah, but you're, and we got into this, you know, this sort of banter. And he said, well, you can get tutors. And so there was a point at which I just looked down like this. And he just kept talking. And he said, uh, so we're agreed. You'll go back. And I'm thinking, if I go back, something bad's going to happen. I don't know if you saw any of the Rocky movies. Many years ago. So, many, so there was a movie, Rocky II, where Burgess Meredith is trying to get Rocky to focus on fighting Apollo Creed. And Rocky is there because his wife, Adrian, is sick. And uh, Burgess Meredith just doesn't get it. You know, he'll knock you tomorrow, Rock. <laughs> <laughs> that was an excellent impression. And so Burgess Meredith doesn't get it. My dad was like that. Mm -hmm. Just didn't get it. Well, you're passing, whatever. And I'm looking down and there's a point. My dad was probably the most challenging person in my life because he could be, you know, you know, intimidating. And so I'll try and recreate it, you know, because I can look right into the camera. So I'm looking down like this. And there's a point at which I say, I'm saying to myself, I can't go back. And I look up at, into his eyes and I say, you don't seem to understand. I'm afraid. I'm afraid. I didn't make a case for it. And I just stared at him. He lowered his eyes and he clenched his fists. And what I realized that was, is he was like Burgess Meredith. He was saying, I don't understand, you know, what you're saying. I don't understand why you're, uh, why you're not going back. I don't understand why you're not doing what I think you should do, mm. but I get that you're afraid. And he said, uh, do what you need to do. Uh, you know, your mom uh, and I'll try and help. So here's my, here's my message to teenagers. If you could, now it's very scary. He could have said, stop being weak. Mm -hmm. So you're taking chances. And, and, and it is Russian roulette because if they yell at you or they say you're weak, you could go up to your room and do something bad. But the point is, I think when you can so purely show fear and pain and vulnerability, I didn't make a case. I didn't know whether I had the right to be afraid. Mm -hmm. It was. And I believe that if there's any part of your parents who cares about you, it will get through. But as soon as you start making a case for it, you, you invite a debate. 
And as soon as you invite, invite a debate, you'll shut down, you'll get frustrated, you'll, you'll say to yourself, why did I even tell them? I knew that's what they would say. It's my own fault. See, I can't talk to them. So th this is, now this is very chancy, but the point is, I, uh, it's like cutting diamonds. And I think if you can show that bared vulnerability, raw, you know, unveneered by uh, sarcasm or whining, I wasn't whining. I just looked at him. I said, I'm afraid. I wasn't whining or complaining. And here's the irony. I've done a lot of stuff. I've trained FBI hostage negotiators. For 25 years, I was the suicide expert. I've been you know, in some pretty dicey things. The most powerful moment of my entire life was that conversation. Uh. Nothing comes close. Amazing. Because it was like speaking your truth totally bare. You know, I could have been swiped down. Now, some yeah. of the people listening would say, I can't take that chance with my parents because they're judgmental. You know, they never listen. Mm -hmm. but then, then what I would say is go out and hear someone. Recently, uh, I've been speaking a lot on the father of the Sandy Hook student who killed himself recently mm -hmm. and the two Parkland students. And what I would say to you, if you're going through that, you got to find people who are going through the same thing because you will listen to them. Everyone else, you won't listen to because you'll think it's easy for them to say it didn't happen to them. Years ago, I was seeing a woman, her only child daughter was viciously murdered. And I mean vicious. The ex-boyfriend took a shotgun and blew her head up into a tree. That's pretty vicious. Her only child. And he escapes to Canada and there's a whole big thing because they can't extradite him because uh, the state that it happened in was capital punishment. So they couldn't get, a, get him back over into the States. And then the FBI and uh, uh, Canadian agents made some deal and they, they shepherded him across that. And I was seeing this woman and I didn't think I was helping her at all. You know, she would just sob or she would just say, uh, I can't go anywhere. Someone says, do you have any kids? I can't go into a supermarket and there's nobody there that's going through what I am. And even my husband, he has step, you know, he has kids from his first marriage. And the only thing that helped is I got her into a group called Parents of Murdered Children. And the LA chapter had a Sharon Tate's mother in it, Doris Tate. That was the Charles Manson killed Sharon Tate. And so these are more often mothers of kids who've been killed. And I went to, I may have even been on one of the advisors, but I went to some of the meetings you don't want to go to these meetings. All they relate to is how their kid was killed and where are they in the apprehension of the murderer. It was horrendous. But what happened is over time, newly minted parents whose kids had been murdered would come into the group and they would see her like their mom. And so, so what am I getting at? When you're trying to connect with other people who haven't been there, no matter what they say, you're going to think, well, it's easy for you to say you haven't been through it. Or if you're stuck in it, it's, you can say, and they say, well, I went through it and I got better. Well, it's easy for you to say, because you got better. I'm not getting better. But what I would say after these things is you have to find people with the identical trauma. It's it's difficult. And we'll wrap this up in the next 10 minutes, yeah. but you just got all my emotions just rising, Mark. And I could talk to you all day long. But there's been, I don't know, part of the uproar surrounding my channel is you know i use a lot of my own personal experience i encourage people to do what you're talking about but i get it like working even at a treatment center therapist would shepherd clients to me even though i'm not a licensed clinician because they're like they're not in recovery and they're like chris i can't get through to this guy or this gal can you just talk to them and they would just sit in my office and we would talk for a long time and they would, you know, stay in treatment. Some of them wanted to leave and stuff like that. But like, that's where that connection came from. And, you know, I, I encourage people to find like support groups like you're talking about where people get it. And you're being so kind as to have me as a guest on your podcast, but that's, that's something that I've been struggling with with my own experience right now is, you know, just having the internet just come at me. It's very hard for me to find somebody who has been through that exact same experience. You know what I mean? And I have a therapist who I work with and she doesn't even really understand YouTube, you know? So half the time I'm explaining what YouTube and social media and the internet is and I'm like, oh, you know? So I feel that disconnection all over again. Like I first found the connection in 12 step programs, but now I'm like, so now here's your, here, yeah. here's your new tagline, okay? This is what you're gonna say to people. Lay it on me. And the point is, and you need to change 
your tone. Uh, I mean, I love your tone because it, it's friendly. It's in your face. It's the opposite. <laughs> it's, it's the anti whining tone. I love it. <laughs> here's what you say. Whatever someone says to you, take the hit. And then what you say is you're absolutely right. I am professionally and technically somewhere between underqualified and, and unqualified. I plead no contest. What I am qualified as is someone who causes people to feel less alone. My main qualification is I don't know exactly know what happens. I have conversations with people and they leave feeling less alone. Mm -hmm. And that's, that seems to result in their feeling better. You know, what would I call that? I don't know, uh, less alone counseling. I don't know what to call it. <laughs> well, and, and, and the main thing is, and what qualifies me, is knowing what it's like to feel what they feel. I would never do anything to take advantage of them, hurt them, exploit them. Now that said, I am a YouTuber, you know, with a following. So I'm, so I'm not above getting my, uh, you know, my numbers up. But someone comes to me hurting and scared and feeling any of the pain that I felt, they couldn't be safer anywhere. And plus, I'm not going to check boxes while they're running out of time and white knuckling it. Yeah. And so I don't know what that qualifies me to do, but I'm, I'm going to keep doing it. And, uh, and, you know, and I respect the fact that, you know, I don't seem to meet your criteria. Damn it, Mark. How do you put these words so eloquently? It's like I need you to just follow me around and speak for me. I need that. Well, here, here's an interesting thing to end it on. So, right? <laughs> So any of you who don't keep journals, keep journals. I got mine right, right here. So, well, notebook slash journal. So we'll end on this because it's kind of fun. So it took me six years to get through four years of medical school because I dropped out twice. And when I finally finished, and I wasn't a writer, I was, you know, I was a med student, probably couldn't put two words together. And so when I get out, I get a crappy little notebook because that's all I thought my words were worth. And I write on the notebook, I can't believe... I made it through. They've released the madman. I, I swear, it's my first entry, and I didn't know I was going to keep journals. If you look at this, this is volume 247. Oh, wow. I have 44,000 pages. The problem is, since I'm a doctor, I can't read my writing. <laughs> what, are you, what are you writing about? Just like... Thoughts, well, feelings, experiences. What, what, what's interesting, because I think at the beginning, I'll, I'll, I'll have to go review them. You know, maybe I was journaling about something, but now what I'll do is I'll have a conversation like this, and I'll write down something that I want to think about more. Maybe two words. Like, I'm going to check if I use the right words. I think it was targeted interventional empathy, but it could be something else. But what happens is I'll write down something that I want to think about later. But what's interesting is... And by the way, I never look back at my journals. I rarely do. But what will happen, there's something about, in my mind, if I thought it and I felt it, even if no one in the world sees it, that was worth the action of writing it down. I there's like something that. about actually writing it down that said, my thought, my feeling is at least worth this. And then what happens, themes come back. And so I, uh, and then the themes can turn into an article. The themes can turn into a book. And when my kids were younger, I remember they, and I used to have really, you know, bigger journals and I don't like to carry them. Like, so I, I put them in the back of my pants and I tuck them while I'm walking. And I remember my oldest daughter, who's 38 and just irreverent, outrageous. And I, I love the heck out of my kids. And actually, I'm, I think I'm going to check with her on this because when she was about six years old, she said, you know, dad, if we had a garage sale and you died and we had to sell your journals we can only get 25 cents a piece because they're used. <laughs> now, I know it'll happen. I'll say, you know, you once said that to me. What do you think of my journals? She's so irreverent. She'd say, inflation, 75 cents. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I might, I might try that strategy because I have like all these separate notebooks and idea here, idea there. And, and like, yeah, maybe I just need to get it out. That's something with my brain. And we can talk about that at another time. But anyways, um, thank you so much for joining me, Mark. And we'll be doing more in the future. And I'm going to link down below um, to the Stay Alive documentary or video. Well, it's called Stay, so the, the, the site, stayalivevideo.com, and, it, and it's called Stay Alive, an intimate conversation about suicide prevention. It's 75 minutes, but because nobody has an attention span like that, we've broken it down into eight chapters. 
and please do a link to the uh, chapter seven, which is the seven words. Yep. Please also show the uh, the music video that was created by Reiko. She's in the documentary. She's this Japanese pop singer. And we're hoping to go into the gaming, animation, and pop world because the darkness and suicide there is huge. Oh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And then I hope we'll visit. Uh, I, have, I have a podcast that you're going to be on called My Wake Up Call. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll share one last story, okay? You can you can edit whatever. Lay you it want. on me. My most recent podcast is with a guy named Jason Reed. And he did a TEDx talk called The Most Important Conversation You Can Have With Your Kids. And he's a serial entrepreneur. He talks about, he said, oh, I, I was in Mexico with my wife and we're just talking about a great life and everything that's going to happen with our kids. And we were just enjoying things. And it was such and such time at night. And I get a text from my son, Ryan. And it says, don't blame yourself. I forget the second thing he said. Uh, uh, you know, I, I'm, I have to do this. Goodbye. Mm-hmm. So he's on vacation with his wife. He gets this text message, he screams, he calls home, the mother-in-law's in the home, and he screams her, go find Ryan. And Ryan goes up to the uh, attic, and then she calls him and she's screaming, he hung himself. And, uh, and he's just distraught, and Ryan left two notes. First note was with the passwords to his computer stuff, and the other note was tell my story, so he's now doing a movie called Tell My Story. So even though he's an entrepreneur, very successful, a couple thousand employees, this is kind of, he has a mission, end teenage teen suicide by 2030. Mm. What was interesting in the podcast, and you can find it at my wake up call, I think it's episode 18. He's an entrepreneur and you might be able to relate to what I'm about to tell you. So he can go and feel really grief stricken. And then he switches into his entrepreneur mode. And this is what we're going to do. And this is what we're going to do. And so he's doing that in the podcast. And I said, uh, Jason, or Jay, I said, I need to stop you. I want you to stop. And, you know, even though it's an audio, it's a video thing, the call we're doing. Mm-hmm. I said, I want you to go into the deepest pain that you felt. Go into it. I said, I won't leave you there. And he goes into it. And I said, okay, you're there? He said, yes. I said, if I gave you advice and tell you what we're going to do, and this is how we're going to fix it, is it reaching you? And he said, no. And I said, is that because what you're really screaming out at me, you you haven't said it, is, Mark, I can't make the hurt get out of my head. I can't get the hurt out of my head. I don't know what to do about it. And you could see as I said it, he felt it. And the point I was making is this is the conversations we need to do with our kids. We need to be able to get them to open up so that they can say, I can't get the hurt out of my head. And then we can't rush in with solutions. We have to go deeper into the abscess. How bad does it feel? Tell me about it at its worst. You know, while we're swimming around in the abscess, let's go into it. Tell me about it at its worst. What happened that caused it? What was your immediate impulse? Well, I felt like, oh, I'm so glad you didn't do that. What did you do? Well, I got drunk. I did such and such. Wow. And then what happened? Well, you know, I woke up the next day and, you know, back to my so-called life or whatever. But do you follow me? That's not solutions. That's going in there and, and, and staying with them in the dark night of the soul. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, I look forward to you going into my, my soul when I become a guest on there. I'm, I'm worried, but I, I need to have a good conversation about all that stuff. And yeah, I'm going to link all that stuff down below the podcast, the video, the music video, and your books too, because I just started Just Listen. I read Talking Crazy first, and I I absolutely love it. I love it. Thank you so much, and we'll do this again sometime, and then I'll let everybody know when I'm over on your podcast. But, yeah, thanks again for being a guest. Thank you.